Hello and welcome to the interior design business. My name is Jeff Hayward and we're recording this episode in front of a live audience at Coombe Lodge in Somerset, the home of Design Central Southwest. Today we're asking the question, do career changers make the best interior designers? Many people would love to have a career in interior design. To get there, some take the conventional route of obtaining an interior design qualification straight out of school and then gain experience within an established design practice. Before then, branching out on their own, many also set up businesses later in life and enjoy a satisfying career having already had a career in another field. We all know at least one successful professional person with reasonable taste who woke up one morning and said to their partner, hey, I've got a great idea. I think I'll start an interior design company. But do these late design bloomers have any advantages over their younger rivals? Is it possible to be a good interior designer without a design qualification? And what should designers from both camps do to ensure they are delivering the best projects for their clients? Welcome to the interior design business. To help us answer these important questions, we are joined today by three designers from very different backgrounds. Charlotte Dawson from Chestnut Interiors, Stephen Tozer from Boaz Studio, and Susie Rumbold, Creative Director of Tusuto Interiors and a past president of the British Institute of Interior Design. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we start, can you each give us a brief introduction to yourself and your business? Stephen, do you want to start us off? Okay, uh, so my name is Stephen Tozer. I um, set up Bow Studio in 2018, um, where following graduating from university, started interior design when I was 40. So I went back and re-studied at university, um, and yeah, set up Bow Studio from there. Excellent, Charlotte, follow that. Um, I was one of those people that woke up and had the bright idea. <laughs> actually, I was going through renovation and my friend was the one who encouraged me and said, mm, actually, you should give this a go. And I had this belief that I needed money behind me to do that. Um, and then I sort of worked with that limiting belief and decided actually I could build a career and change and train um, alongside what I was doing before, which was teaching. Um, so that was just pre-COVID actually. So COVID was great for building a website because I had not a lot else to do. Um, and then gradually over time I've worked away from teaching and now full time as of July last year I've um, been working for myself Chestnut Interiors. And you're based down in Cornwall too, <coughs> Based is that in right? Cornwall as well, yeah. Excellent. Obviously I wasn't from, I'm not from Cornwall, I'm from Derbyshire and that's actually where the seed started to grow. Um, so there's been a lot of changes along the way with the last three years moving house couple of surgeries but we've got there in the end. <laughs> and Susie what about you? Okay so I'm creative director of Tesudo Interiors. We've been training for just over 30 years. We were actually 30 years old on the 1st of March this year and I was in my early 30s when I became an interior designer having had a, f a career in fashion retailing. So I was in the buying office at Topshop for many years prior to that. So answer me this question, Susie. Had you always wanted to be an interior designer? No, no. Actually, I wanted to be a fashion designer, but I didn't have fine art, so that was the route that was barred to me. Plus, I'm really old, and there really weren't <laughs> degrees in fashion design unless you had a, an art background in those days. Um, so I went into fashion retail as a kind of, you know, as close as I could get to what I really wanted to do. But I studied at the London College of Fashion, um, and that was my that was my thing was I thought I was going to stay in retail and, and the reason I ended up in interiors was it was a throwaway remark from a friend who said you know you, you really should consider interior design and I thought yeah maybe I should <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and what about you Stephen were you in short trousers dreaming of being <coughs> an interior designer? I was I think much to my parents disdain I was always shifting my bedroom furniture around <laughs> always painting the walls always redesigning whatever was in there. Um, but I guess at that point in time, it was, interior design wasn't a big thing like it is now. Um, so I went away to university, studied hotel and catering management. Actually, one of the modules there was interior design for hotel rooms. Um, and that was the only module in that degree that I got first in. So I was like, oh, I'm really good at this. But at the end, the bright lights of London kind of uh, lured me there as a <coughs> restaurant manager. So I was a restaurant manager for a couple of years in London before I then started a career in customer marketing. So working for big brands um, to help them sell more product. Uh, and then I did that for 15 years. 
but you always had that kind of burning desire. Yeah, so I did an evening course at KLC um, whilst I was working in London, and that was like, I really like this. And then when I was 34, my mum died, and that was kind of this big, I don't know, it makes you open your eyes going through something like that. And so that's when I moved back to Cornwall. And then I got another job doing customer marketing there. And four years later, I was like, no, this is crazy. Like, I need to change my career. I could, yeah. So I, that's when I was like, woke up one morning. I was like, okay, we need to s do something. And uh, yeah, I yeah, put, signed myself up for the interior design degree at Falmouth University. Mm -hmm. And here you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlotte, so you were working on a renovation, but before that, did you did you have aspirations in design at all? No, I used to play schools at home. I used to want to be a teacher, which obviously I then went on to be a teacher for 12 years. But um, in hindsight, similar to Stephen, Pippi Longstocking was, you know, taking all the furniture out of my room from being about six years old. I the smallest room in the house, and I still thought I could put it back in in a different way. <laughs> it just isn't possible. <laughs> um, yeah, smashing fist, fish tanks in the process, um, bring, yeah, bringing everything out. And then when I had a classroom, Mattier would go home on a Friday thinking, what am I coming back to on Monday? Because Friday evening, I'd take everything around my classroom and move all of that. So I was kind of always playing with it. Um, obviously, at home as well. I had, at that point, I'd had three, three houses uh, before I'd changed. Um, my mum was a curtain maker and still will every now and then if I pull a leg hard enough. Um, so I was going to wonderful properties with her when I was off school, seeing all these beautiful curtains and so playing with the sample book. So it's probably a little bit of nature nurture there, but I didn't yeah. always want to do it. And, and being a teacher, what, what skills do you think you've brought to interior design from teaching? Solving a crisis quite quickly. <laughs> uh, cleaning up mess quite quickly. Um, planning, organising. Uh, communicating with people, I think trying to understand uh, what people are really saying and what, what, their, what their barriers and difficulties are um, and how to overcome them. So, yeah, definitely think planning is a big, big part of them. And managing projects and dealing with pressures and deadlines is all, all transferable <laughs> skills. What about you, Susie? Well, I've got, a, I've, I suppose, a list of them really. Um, so I did, I've eventually got around to doing technical drawing at the London College of Fashion, which is now part of Central St Martins, but it, that didn't exist in those days either. Um, so I, I had some drawing skills that I could bring with me, so I was good at measuring and working things out and angles and the kind of math side of it. Um, through my role at Topshop, I was used to planning and balancing fashion ranges, so colours, fabrics, textures, that sort of thing, so that was that was handy. I'd always have to, had a, a love of fabric again through the tailoring and the, the, the clothes fashion side. Um, and then in terms of, I don't know, organising, running teams, that sort of thing, solving problems, again, dealing with difficult people. So, uh, you know, Philip Green was one of the people that I worked for and it was a fairly toxic environment to, to be in. So you had to be pretty good at ducking and weaving around some pretty shocking people. Um, what else did I bring with me? I've got it in my head that there's one other thing. Ask, ask Stephen and I'll think about it. <laughs> okay, Stephen. <laughs> what about you? I mean, branding and marketing, that, that, that demands visual awareness and spatial awareness and everything else, I guess. Yeah, and I, I think that the whole process aspect um, of sort of launching a product and that kind of thing came in really useful as well. Um, and I guess sales, you know, we were always selling a product and I think when we're doing interior design, we're selling our schemes. Um, and I think that's one thing when I started at the university and we did our first project and you've got to stand up in front of your cohort and talk about your project, is that I, I wasn't nervous at all, I would just, could just do it. Whereas lots of the younger students were like looking at their feet or had shaky pieces mm. of paper and I was like, ah, oh, this is okay, like I can do this. Because yeah. <laughs> I think I was going into it like, I'm really old compared to these guys, they're coming in fresh and, and you know, they've got great ideas. But then actually I was like, well, my ideas are really great and I can sell them. And so, yeah, confidence was a big thing. Um, and yeah, commu I think like um, Charlotte said, communication, like just being able to pick up the phone to people, which is something you just take for That's granted. That's the confidence of age yeah. though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But you know, I could just pick up the phone to anyone and just be like, what's going on on site? And whereas I think sometimes, you know, that can be a barrier for mm -hmm. a lot of people. So. A lot of this seems to me like life experience yes. that you can bring to it. Yeah, totally. 
Do you say the same, Susie? Yeah, no, no I, I, I agree. And I, I was just interested in pointing, picking up the point about the barrier that you just mentioned. I don't know how you found it going onto building sites, but I know yeah. it's an environment that lots of young women, because they're oh, yeah. very male-dominated places, find really difficult to cope with. And I've got a fantastically talented young team, but you know, they still, if I'm not around and I'm not keeping an eye on things, find themselves in situations where they're actively bullied on sites by you know mm. <laughs> contractors yeah. and their and their subcontractors. So that's not great. Yeah. I mean, dealing with difficult parents must have helped in those sorts of scenarios. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and embarrassing situations. You know, had a problem today. You know, Molly's ponytail's being chopped off in the role play hairdressers. You know, <laughs> so dealing with things like that <laughs> equips you. Okay, something went wrong, but don't worry, we're going to sort it out. So yeah, I think having that confidence, life experience. <laughs> I'm, just you confidence. I'm just wondering how you sort that one out, though. Hair extensions? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> Time for a bob. Um, yeah, no, I think life experience is really important. It gives you that mm. confidence when you've gone through highs and lows to be able to react, you know, in a yeah. way that's not reactive. But as yeah. well, I think when you're a bit later in life, you appreciate the value of things. So when you're working with clients, you know that they're putting a lot into their home to make it really special and that's why you're there. And they're investing time, they're investing money and I think you've got to have a respect for that, which you may not have if you've not had some life experiences and, mm. and you know, saved for something really important yourself. Mm. Um, you know, but, but seeing also young trades, sometimes they can be a little bit uh, heavy handed and oh that's a brand new carpet and you know so much money but they're so young they kind of don't really realize that that carpet was a thousand pounds so <laughs> but also the yeah. stresses and strains that people in families undergo you know you've got you know parents who are working and kids in school and they're trying to do up the house as well and they're spending mm. every penny they've earned of their tax after tax income on this on this you know, they're pouring heart and soul into this project and just understanding the value of that for them and, and making those decisions that make that house that home even more livable than, yeah. than if they tried to do it themselves. And you could only do that if you've kind of been through it yourself and mm -hmm. you've realised that you need certain storage solutions oh, yeah. and you yeah. know it's that practical stuff that you bring with mm -hmm. you when you come into it later. And I, I think you all point to the pressures that you deal with as an interior designer, whether that's deadlines or just mm -hmm. confrontation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you all sound like you've come from environments <laughs> where you're familiar with that. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I used to work with like Tesco as a client and they were quite hard. They like to play hardball with you. And so that, just as an experience with working with their buying team and stuff was really good for what we do now is that actually I knew I could do it then. So I have no issue now with yeah, talking to contractors on site or I think sometimes when we go to site and the contractors are there all the time and they've been talking to clients like, pitching other ideas and stuff and I think sometimes you've got to resell the idea mm. and be like okay this is why we're doing this this is why it is this colour um, and so on and so mm. yeah it's good to have that and Charlotte no problem then in being assertive when you need to be no I think it's, it's important to be kind and be friendly but obviously at mm. times well if you're working with somebody and they're asking for your help you need to be in a position where you can practice that assertion and know what you're talking about and feel confident with it which again comes with life experience sometimes doesn't it mm. but also not to let the clients walk all over you mm. i mean yeah, they, they, it's yeah. not always the contractors that are the bad guys sometimes the clients can be pretty toxic too mm -hmm. Mm. Been okay. quite fortunate so far. I'm trying to find something wood. But <laughs> <laughs> so, Susie, I'm going to ask this one of you. The BIID talks about six years being the the period that you really need to to then become an interior designer or become a registered interior designer with the institute. So, do you think that's a sensible approach? Yeah, I do. So, what what the beads say is that you can have <clears throat> so what they they do is they say it's six years of combined education and experience. So you might have a three-year degree and then three years of experience or you might have a, a one-year qualification or a three-month you know so you just have to make up the time that you haven't been in education in in, in experience and they recognize that actually interior designers coming straight out of college are not fully formed because actually mm. the, the colleges can only teach you so much and you really then need to kind of go out there and do it for real and deal with the mm -hmm. clients and deal with the yeah. contractors and look at the problems on site and do the problem solving and build the teams and write out, you know, type out the audit confirmation and whatever else you need to do mm. in order and understand the materiality in order to really be able to be let loose on the public. It's I think. like passing mm. a driving test, isn't it's it? It's just yeah. like it's passing a driving <laughs> test. That's a really good analogy actually, yeah. 
Yeah, we spoke about yeah. it in the car, didn't we? Yeah. That was how you said. I said like you you learn so much at university, but then you get out there and it's like, oh, you've got to do fee proposals. How do you do that? And <laughs> how you know how do you? Oh, we need T's and C's. But like, just as an example, I was because I do a bit of lecturing at, um, to third year degree students, and I was over at the University of East London a few weeks ago. After the lecture, I was chatting to some of the academic staff, and we were talking about fee proposals and I was just basically saying well they're incredibly important because you have to write down because it forms the basis of your contract with the client mm -hmm. so if you haven't if you haven't documented all that stuff you don't know what you're signing on for and neither does the client and I said to you know I was explaining how we restate the brief and blah 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 and he said because it sounds like an incredible amount of work as if he was really surprised that this was something that we had to do now you know what message is he giving to his third year degree students if they don't realize that that has to happen. Mm -hmm. I was quite shocked. And were you surprised at that when you were being taught interior design? I was surprised. I guess they're not they're not there to teach us to run a business, and so I almost needed another year, perhaps post graduating, on how to run a business because that's a whole other thing than interior design. Mm. You know. Um, Actually, a cash flow forecast is as important to me as um, an FF and E spreadsheet. You know, it's actually I need to know where the business is going, not just you know everything else. Mm. So yeah, it was a huge learning curve. Um, I mean, mm. we were quite fortunate in Cornwall that um, because it's classed as an area of deprivation within the EU, there were quite a few different networks to get business small business support. Um, so I was able to get people who to help me understand what I needed to do to run a small business, which at the time I was maybe a bit naive going into it. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be an interior designer and actually find I'm not doing that much interior design. I'm running around trying to, you know, do my accounts and tax returns. But I, I also, when I first started, and this is again a seriously long time ago, the RBKC were running a, and it really wasn't for people in the southern part of, I don't know whether everyone's familiar with, Royal Bar Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in London is a big elliptical shaped thing and all the rich people live at the bottom but the top of the borough actually where you get up above up into sort of deepest darkest beyond Notting Hill Labrick Grove Way is incredibly deprived a couple of the nastiest sink estates in the city are up there so they were doing a, a th across three weekends a small business development course for anyone that lived in the borough so I kind of got in on the coattails of this which was great. So I did the mm -hmm. same, and you know, yeah. there's, there's an amazing amount of help out there if you look for it. Actually, yeah. yeah. What about you, Charlotte? I mean, it must have been quite terrifying when you <laughs> thought I'm going to be an interior designer suddenly. Uh, yes, in some ways, but coming from a teaching background, I believe that you learn in different ways, and I am one of those people that likes to learn from doing. So similarly, you know, going learning to drive and going to university and doing your your degree specifically, Stephen, you then have to learn to practice that. And that comes in real, real in the real world. Um, and for me, that's where I, I feel like I learn better. So I listen to podcast after podcast. I'm often saying to students, have you listened to this one yet? Have you listened to this one? <laughs> Sending them on both interior design and business um, because there, there are two balls to keep juggling there. Mm -hmm. um, reading as much as I can, watching things on YouTube like we've spoken about, speaking to other people. So I do think there's an education to be had beyond university and yeah mm. that six years I think actually it, it's longer you just have to continually mm. keep learning so it's the products are changing all the time regulations are changing all the time um, yeah you've just got to keep moving with it and how how um, soon did you have somebody that you could call upon a network, if you like, of people that could help you. How soon were you able to build sure. that? <laughs> Stephen, my good friend here. Um, actually, when I moved to Cornwall, I felt really isolated. I didn't know anybody. We didn't have any family there. Um, so that was the, the point where I th actually, like, fresh start, throw all the balls up in the air. What do I really want to do? And how do I get stuck into that? And how do I find out where all the interior hotspots are in this county? So I only knew, like, one little shop that I'd been in on holiday. Um, so I turned to Instagram and I found lots of local interior designers, messaged them all introducing myself, um, really friendly. I'd heard something in a podcast about rising tides, raising all ships and thought actually, you know, they're my kind of people that are kind and want to help. I'm, I consider myself a really helpful person, so I wanted to attract helpful people that didn't feel intimidated, like you said earlier, there's plenty of work, you know, we need to help, help people. Um, so yeah, connected with lots of interior designers in Cornwall. 
uh, made a little community, Cornwall Interior Designers, otherwise known as the CID. Um, and <laughs> we have little occasions where we meet up just for pizza and a chat, or we have organised some workshops with um, a Cornwall-based wallpaper design company called Bobby Beck. Um, we're trying to organise a painting workshop at a tile play. So they're my kind of people that I uh, try to connect yeah, with and try help. And uh, yeah, the tribe. Mm. Um, and I, it wasn't until I got to know Stephen a little bit better that he told me the the first time we met as a group was a bit like my coming out party. <laughs> I said, I'm not actually an interior designer <laughs> yet, but you guys, you know, I want to get to know you. <laughs> so. She'd organised all these interior designers to get together and she's like, actually, I've got a confession. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Uh, but thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> I was so convincing, and Stephen was like, "But your Instagram grid looks so..." And I was like, "Well, that is real. You know, it's not made up." <laughs> but I'm just balancing the two things at the moment. So, so working, yeah, that's my community. <laughs> and working at creating that little network really helped you. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, yeah and Stephen's such a good yeah. friend. Yeah. So, um, and there's, there's and Alice, who's him yeah. as well. Yeah. So Alice joins us, and then yeah, we, we're always trying to find other people who want to talk to us and be kind, don't we? Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. And, and Susie, that's a lot like the BIID, how it operates in London. Yeah, it is certainly. a bit. Yeah, so I think the, the, the London markets, you know, there's, there are thousands of interior designers and more kind of joining the profession every minute. Um, but there's a there's a great network through the BIID. Mm. Yeah. Lots mm -hmm. and lots of friends. I think it's one of the advantages of social media that you can build those little community groups as well and, and yeah, really get to know people that yeah. are of similar similar mindsets and similar professions. Yeah. People well. message, don't they, asking in, in our CID group, you know, I need oh, yeah. a, a joiner or does anybody, clients getting rid of this huge table, does anybody have a project that it mm, might, it might work say. with? And yeah, it's really nice actually just to see mm. those messages coming through that people are able to ask for help. Mm. And I, I belong to another group of designers, actually, which is a WhatsApp group, and we, mm. we take it in turn. Some of them are reasonably well connected, and we, well, I don't do it so much, but other people arrange for us to go on tours of things. So if there's a new hotel opening, they'll, oh, you know, someone nice. will schmooze the general manager and they'll, they'll get us in for a bit of a private tour, that's and that, a that's really yeah. good yeah. fun. There yeah. we go, hotels go. next to yeah. even. <laughs> but, but you know what, there's real power in those little communities. If, you know, you can actually do something, so anybody who wants that as an idea, start a little yeah. community in the region, because the, the more of you there are in those groups, the more you can do and progress, I think. Yeah, and there's sometimes as well, it might be an occasion where somebody gets an inquiry and a client needs something to change in quickly and, they, and you can't take on that work, but you know somebody that can if they've had a project mm. delay or something like that. So it's really helpful to be able to refer and, um, and work like that. Very good, okay. Um, Susie, you talked about the, the qualification element of, of what that BIID, three years of experience and three years of education combined, but how easy is it to get qualifications, do you think? I think for anyone changing careers, it's, there's a lot of barriers to be able to, you know, the, the privates, you know, you went off and did a three year degree, mm -hmm. so you're not earning for three years or you're mm -hmm. trying, you're only earning part time if you're doing other jobs. Mm -hmm. But for, you know, and the, and the private design schools are really, really, really expensive. So for someone to actually be able to take a year out of their life and pay those fees and survive, you know, it, it's a, you know, unless you have deep pockets, you know, or somebody subbing you on that, you, it's going to be, a, that's a real barrier. So people end up doing the short courses because it's all mm. they can afford. They'll do the 10 week course, which is fine, but it kind of, it's not, it's not enough sometimes. So I, I think, you know, the, the problem is then, you know, we end up with, it's a certain demographic that keeps entering the profession, so it doesn't make for inclusiveness, particularly. It, I think it's a real problem. I mean, when I when I started, there really weren't any interior design courses, so mm. I'm I'm a complete fraud. But I mean, everybody that I employ is you know has at least mm. one year, if not more, of, of yeah. interior design education. And yeah. When you were looking around, Stephen, mm. did you did you think about shorter course options rather than a degree? I did. Um, I looked a lot, I mean I was in a, a fortunate position that I could do it financially, um, but what I wanted to do was to change my mindset, because I think I was in this corporate world of, I don't know, just that, and I was like, I need to completely change the way I think, and therefore the three year course, and it was a very intense, in-depth course that I felt I was gonna get more from. Um, yeah, so I was just able to throw myself in fully. Um, I did look around at different courses, but the one at Falmouth just had quite an architectural bent as well, which mm. drove me. I mean, it's a really cool. respected school. I loved it. Yeah. I really, yeah. really enjoyed, mm. really enjoyed mm. the course. Okay, Charlotte, what, what do you think then? I've got like 
nerd envy right now because I would have absolutely loved and still would absolutely love I, I, do, I do love learning I did a postgraduate degree in dyslexia when I was teaching full time so I just have that passion for finding out new information um, but I, yeah I wasn't like Susie says there's a barrier there financially I wasn't in a position to be able to do that um, you know you have a mortgage you've got accustomed to a certain salary once you've progressed in a career for 12 years you're at a certain pay point um, and it's really difficult then to, to, to come away from that. So I just haven't been in that position to do it. Um, but I yeah, go teacher on myself and I'm like, where are your gaps in your learning? Mm. <laughs> and how can you fill them? Mm. <laughs> so find that knowledge elsewhere. And I think, yeah, we are continually learning. And as Susie said, you know, I'm a fraud. Well, you're not because you are so successful and you, you know you've got such knowledge now over 30 years. Um, but that does bring that imposter syndrome. And you think, oh, I didn't go to university, but... Hey ho, here we are. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a barrier not just to people taking courses, there's also a barrier to entry in the sense of, you know, am I going to give up a really good, well paid mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. and start from scratch and find a client and maybe earn nothing for the first six months mm -hmm. and maybe make, make a few more, expensive yeah. mistakes? And so, I, the only reason I was able to do it was because I got made redundant. Mm -hmm. So, I had some money. Mm -hmm. So, I was able to pay myself a small salary mm -hmm. for about eight months because, you know, they give it to yeah. you tax free if you're made redundant. Which you know, so I, I did have a cash cushion. Mm. I could not have done it without that. Mm. Do you think the online courses that you can take have a value? I think they have some value. I don't don't want to say the wrong thing here. I don't know enough about them. Mm. Um, some of the ones I've looked at tend to be a bit just on the kind of decoratory that they're not de in depth enough no. mm. and I don't know how you can teach that unless you've got at least some face to face. Mm. Some of the blended learning courses I think are probably better. Mm. 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 I think there's such a breadth in the online courses that are available. You, know, you can pick up a course for £40 and you can pick up a course for £4,000 online and there's such a breadth in, in those that I actually did a relatively cheap one I was like I know this, oh I know this oh, I know this as well. And I felt really confident. So I suppose it served a purpose there, but it, it gave me a little bit of a foundation and was like, yeah, keep going. Mm. You know, there's plenty more to learn. I'm not naive to that. Um, so just keep, keep learning. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think they do have a place, but you've got to be quite critical of them, what they're offering. I just wonder what the solution is. There are, there are mm. plenty of issues, but what, what would you advise? I mean, I just enjoyed being in, so our, our course was treated as like a studio, so you would mm. be there all day, the lecturers would come around and talk to you about your project and about your sketching and all that, kind of, and I just felt that you learned a lot more and you, I treated it like a job, so I was there to work kind of on, on that, and I don't know if I'd do that if I was at home, mm. you know, oh, or, or if you're behind the camera, that's not like you wouldn't necessarily be in front of a client mm. and so I liked that I don't know the, the talking do you to think though because you did it later in life you brought a maturity of attitude to the study process as well that you're not taking it for granted the way yeah. someone oh, totally. at the age of 19 yeah. is I mean I, this was my second degree and yeah. my first degree was very very different <laughs> <laughs> to this one and this one I was like having to pay for and yeah everything as well. so it first focuses degree, the mind to, it totally yeah. I was like I'm taking three years out of earning, or three years out of my pension that was not going into, you know, and all that kind of thing. It's like, this is a massive investment. I'm not wasting my time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to prove myself against, that was what I was like, I want a thirst for every single project. <laughs> and did I, you do it? Uh, one, I didn't. Mm. And yeah, it Stephen. lives with me to this day. It's like a, yeah, a Cindy trade stand. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. But, Cindy uh, Dolls trade yeah, stand. Yeah, I, oh, I relaunched Cindy. Uh, I had one as a mm. trade stand. But I got two of them. I'd rather not talk about that. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, if you're somebody who's career changing, you've perhaps done some online training, you want to get some work experience, really. How mm. easy is that to do, Susie? Again, I think there's huge barriers there. I think it's very difficult to find companies mm. that will take you on because you're competing head to head with, you know, a all the people that have, have got the got the qualifications, but b the ones that can afford mm. to take on an internship. Mm. So the same financial pressures apply. It's it's you know unless you've got a, a friend that kind of is prepared to give you a go, or you can mm. do it and support yourself in some other way. It's mm. it's 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 very problematic, which yeah. I think is why so many people, frustrated at every turn, end up just going, oh, what the hell, I'm just going to set up on my own. Yeah. That is exactly how I felt. And I think I was, because I didn't know 
enough interior design to like ask for work experience and I think I felt like they're going to be like who is this rocking up you know is this like they're expecting somebody in their 20s <laughs> someone in their 40s rocks up for work experience you know they think I'm some undercover spy or something which I guess I effectively am if I'm looking <laughs> you know, you yeah. um, but yeah I, I mean I was lucky enough to have like lecturers and things that I could call and ask for support because yeah. I think otherwise I would have been a bit lost um, yeah to, so yeah I've gone into this having never worked in an interior design studio or had work experience in one so wow. yeah it's a bit and look at yeah, you now though what a success yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do, you, do you think that's a, an issue that you face Charlotte sort of yeah. ageism and, and sort of being old, being a slightly more I don't person. think I um, I don't think I look that mature. <laughs> Take myself seriously when I need to. Um, but work experience wise though, I I didn't get any work experience in, in the formal in fact I had an email this week from from a young student at a college asking if I offered work experience. I was like, I would absolutely love to. You know, I think there's probably lots of studios that would love to offer mm -hmm. that. Um, but it, yeah, I didn't access um, work experience. The closest thing I could get, like again going, well, how can I Create something similar would be to was to offer voluntary um, so voluntary service and mm. for for a friend and a friend of a friend and then somebody that I didn't know to try and practice working with people and I was very transparent about it mm. um, and and they had a free service so. But do you think all as, all, all as practitioners now? Do you think if you've got a CV from somebody saying, oh, I don't know, they're in their thirties or forties and they want some work experience, would you look differently upon that than you would somebody younger? Oh, I think brilliant. They're going to know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'll be confident and able to solve some problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, Stephen? How do you feel about it? Yeah, I wouldn't have any. We're taking on our first work experience student actually, but they, I think, they're sixteen who was coming in with us. Um, you can make that, me for that would be interesting. That. <laughs> yeah, might need to, um, but yeah, I wouldn't have an issue with taking somebody older. I think obviously, having gone through it myself, is that mm. I could yeah. understand why they would want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I do feel like a regret is probably that I have not done that, and that I did need to go and you know do six months or something at a studio to mm. understand what what's under the skin of uh, other other businesses. I mean, I think you'll, you'll get there in the end, but it takes a lot longer yeah. because you make so many mistakes. I mean, I've made every mistake going and then some, mm. some unique mm. ones that I just invented. <laughs> well, there was some, like, obviously when you start, you have no portfolio. And so we're like, okay, we're just going to get to this, the end of this project and then we're going to photograph it and it's going to be great. And, um, and then the client turns around and says, no, we don't want it photographed. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, but, but we need this for our portfolio. <laughs> But they're like, oh, really sorry, we don't really want it going public. And it's like, so now in our terms and conditions, we've got this will be photographed at the, yeah. at the end. And it is that whole learning process, like, okay, another thing to add into the T's and C's that we need to kind of get through. Mm. But uh, it's, yeah, difficult, but uh, a big learning process. What about location? Do you think location could be a barrier where you are in the country? I think so, yeah. Mm. Where, where I was originally in Derbyshire, oh, this was pandemic time, so, well, at the very beginning of it. Can you believe that was three years ago, <laughs> by the way? No. Like, ridiculous. <laughs> like, now, isn't it? I don't know what the date is, but anyway. Um, th there, the, the potential for work was, in my opinion, smaller than where I am now in Cornwall. So, actually, when, when the move happened, I was like, aha, now we are in a better position. So, I do think location does mm. have an impact on So you if you are going to set up on your own or you are going to career change, understand your local market and, and yeah. identify if there's a need for you. If, yeah, it depends. I mean, some people offer e-design, don't they? And they can then work across the country and into other, and, you know, over, overseas as well. Um, so I think it depends on what services you specifically want to offer and if there is a need for that in your local area or, or where you can easily access. Mm. Definitely. Yeah, I think, I think the, the remote working is much more prevalent in commercial work. Mm. I think if you're doing private residential work, you probably need to be local to, th not necessarily, but often, because mm. the clients want that close personal Correct. relationship with you. A lot of second homeowners seem to use their like London interior designer and bring them down to court yeah. to mm. do it. And that's a bit of a barrier, because you know, if you do want to get into high-end residential work, you kind of need to be working with those clients because they're the ones with the money who have got the, the second homes and stuff in Cornwall. So it's like, how do you get in front of these clients who aren't local? How yeah. do you, you find them? So sort of 
doing a lot of work with architects and stuff at the moment because they do seem to be using Cornish architects. So it's like, how do we get them to use Cornish interior designers? Mm. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so um, tell me about getting your first client, Susie. How easy was that? Oh, I was. I was so one of the things because I had the fashion background. I, I was. I was curtain making, and I was making soft furnishings to begin with because I could do that. So I kind of put some ads in the local paper, and I was keeping body and soul together, churning out curtains. But then, um, a friends friends of mine from America were um, doing a lateral conversion on a little apartment in Earl's Court, and they just were very kind and took a chance on me. And I worked with an amazing architect on that job. And I, you know, used to go to these site meetings, and I had no idea what anyone was talking <laughs> about. And I used to just keep my mouth shut and my ears open, and I would write things down and then frantically look them up yeah. when I got back to the to the office. Um, and yeah, just learnt loads, and it just kind of gradually, gradually, gradually went on from there. So I started doing small resi projects, mostly decorative, then kind of became more architectural, and then started. To, I think I took on my first staff member after I'd been working for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just just gradually it went on from there, and then we built and built and built and built, and we now do you know we do huge projects now. We're a small team, but we're working on we're currently designing dementia units for a Canadian care home group, where we're designing um, student residential buildings for another group that has a massive portfolio. Um, and we're doing some very high end residential work as well. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a complete mixed bag. It's very it's very um, challenging. And, and evolved, so and, ev and evolved, that first yes. Project. But then, so is the profession. Hmm. You know, interior design when I started was not the interior design that we all know and understand today. It was, it was tiny. You know, people would have an architect, they'd finish their building project, and then they'd bring an interior hmm. designer in. So you would came in and you did the colours and the blah blah, and. It, it, it was frustrating, really, because you'd walk into a room and and the client would say. What would you do with this space? And I said, Well, I think you need to readdress your right your lighting. And they'd look crestfallen and say, Oh, we just had the house rewired. Mm. And so that, you know, that was yeah, that was That's but I yeah, so it's really yeah. moved. People's yeah. the public's understanding of what we do is slowly shifting, I think, which is good too. Mm. Yeah. What about getting your first client, Stephen? How was that? So, um, I was quite lucky. So having graduated from the university, one of my first projects was for the university. So um, the School of Communication, so journalism and writing, uh, they, had, they were moving building to this amazing old Georgian townhouse within the uh, university campus. And they wanted to use one of the old rooms there for a writer's space and to give it this atmosphere for students to go in and just be able to write freely, talk to each other. Um, and it was all about books and the newspapers and the journals that were all produced by the students and um, the alumni and that kind of thing. So that was my first project and it was this amazing, amazing space. But working with this whole team of contractors and everything, it was all quite new. And I just adopted a baby at that point in time as well. Oh my gosh. And they were calling me like the day before, uh, like, can you come down tomorrow? We need you to sign off, you know, uh, finishes for cladding or whatever it might have been. Uh, I was like, yeah, but I'm going to have a baby with me. <laughs> so I was literally <laughs> going on site with a baby strapped to my chest and like, okay, so yeah, this, I'm happy with sign this off. We can do this, we can do this. It was an amazing learning curve, um, but just fantastic that they put that faith in me and everything as well. And just seeing the, the, that before and after, it was like, okay, this is what it's all about. So it probably helped you being an alumni yourself, didn't it? Yeah, totally. And I used that as kind of the ethos of the room as well. So I used, uh, I mean, it's a big art-based university, so I used artwork by students. Um, the lights were made by um, a sustainability student. Um, yeah, all the, uh, it was all about showcasing the books and the journals mm. and everything that the students have produced. So yeah, it was this whole kind of alumni sort mm. of uh, thing. Oh, and the lighting design as well was... I, I got uh, ex alum to help me with that as well. So. Very good. Yeah. So Charlotte, come on. What, what's your story from how long from that Eureka moment to getting that first client? Uh, well, the first client that really felt like a client that wasn't sort of a friend or a friend of a friend or some sort of voluntary experience um, in, in Cornwall, actually, a lovely couple who would bought a house, they'd been doing an extension and they'd be making decisions that they openly said, you know, we're making these decisions and actually then we're having to reverse on them because we feel like we're making mistakes. Um, and this keeps happening, so we really need some help. There wasn't the case of the architect and the designer working together, unfortunately, at that point. 
Um, and they contacted me through my website and I was absolutely delighted because I was like, bingo, it works because I, I did that myself. Um, and yeah, really lovely couple and we're still in touch. In fact, I emailed her this morning. Um, we meet for a mojito every now and then and yeah, just a, a great relationship that actually, they were really supportive of me um, and knew that I was new to the county. So they were you know, offering those of contacts that I could get in touch with. And That's great. Just, mm. just really supportive, yeah. really kind. Um, yeah, good perfect client really. I mean with hundreds of career changes entering what's an already saturated market, why do you think there's still such an increased demand for interior designers? I think the amount of overall work must be going up. I mean if you think about it, there are, you know, the there's, there's schools and the colleges are churning out interior designers and there are, you know, there are new universities offering interior design courses all mm. the time. You know, there, there, I don't think there's a university in the country now that doesn't have some sort of interiors, interior architecture or interior design qualification that they offer so it must be that the overall amount of work is it's not it's no longer just the you know for the for the very 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 rich on mm. the on the mm -hmm. I mean obviously the commercial sides always existed but in terms of residential it was a fairly rarefied strata I think once upon a time mm. and I think going back to my first client it was only because they were American there's no way that somebody doing a little building like that as a young couple in London in those days would have hired mm. an interior designer because they just wouldn't yeah. have done you know, they'd have done it themselves. Mm. Um, but because they were American, because Pat was American and she came from California, everybody in America, of course you don't do anything yourself, you always <laughs> hire an interior designer, so she did. And, and do you think um, there's still an opportunity to differentiate yourself between being a designer and a decorator? I, the, yes, I, I, think, I think so. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definition that I think most people now understand, and when I explain it to people, I would say that if you were to take a building, peel the roof off, mm. turn it upside down, give it an almighty shake, whatever falls out is the interior decoration, and whatever stays stuck to the building is the interior design. So the, 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 the rugs, the lamps, the paintings, the furniture, the, you know, the vases, whatever, that's, that's the interior decoration. But the, the flooring, the architectural lighting, those things, that's, that's the interior design. So it's a, it's a continuum in terms of the service that mm -hmm. we all offer. I don't know that there are that many people. I know some colleges still offer interior decoration courses, but I, I don't know how much use they are. We felt if you can justify why something is there, it's designed, it's for a purpose and for an end user. So mm. we felt that the, the theory was a key word that kind of distinguished between design and decoration. Mm. Continuing education, teacher in the middle. I mean, oh, I'd love we're to always continue learning, education. So. <laughs> um, I think I, I learn a lot from other people, uh, hugely, um, whether that's listening to podcasts or like directly working with people. So I'm really fortunate to work um, with Hugo De Silva, who's a great designer on the hotels, and that's something that I wouldn't approach on my own because I know you've got to know your limitations, haven't you, with your training and what ex what experience you have had. Um, so similar to, to what um, Susie and Stephen have just been saying, actually, you uh, wouldn't approach anything without the qualification to do it, or um, with, certainly not without leaning on the help of structural engineers and architects. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do learn a lot from other people, mm -hmm. and I'm lucky that the people that are around me are really kind. So that's nice. What about you, Stephen? Where are you still um, learning? We have a massive sustainability focus, so we're currently going through B Corp accreditation, and so a big thing for us is learning about the history of products, what's going to happen to them when we finish with them, so making sure that where we can, we're using cradle to cradle products and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, so we, there's always a learning process and things that maybe one day we think are sustainable, find out the next scratch below the surface and so on. So there's a lot of research that goes into what we do and what we use, and what we reuse. Um, so there's that as part of sort of our education, but then as well, just continuing like the understanding of how to run a more effective business and marketing ourselves better and that kind of thing as well, so that we can grow, so that we as a business are sustainable as well. Um, okay. So yeah, just yeah, always evolving. And what about you, Susie? What resources would you point people to? Oh well, we I mean, there's lots of. So the CPD is continuing professional development. Again, the, going back to the BIID, anyone mm. who's a registered designer has to get 20 hours a year. So, and that can take the form of listening to podcasts or, or reading, but often it's it's kind of day courses or courses mm -hmm. or evening courses or a lecture you go to. And I do all sorts of things. I did a I did a day course a couple two or three weeks ago uh, via the Centre for Accessible. Sorry, start again. 
Centre for Accessible Environments, the CAE, um, on design for neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. So looking at looking at mm -hmm. dementia and, and design for autism and the, and the visual and, and auditory triggers that, that may some people might find difficult. So there's so much stuff out there. Yeah, yeah really, 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 really interesting. So yeah, where and I and I also make sure that all my team do their CPDs. So not only do I do my 20 hours a year, they all have to do it as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's, there's new products coming to the market. There's new thinking all the time about the way the profession. You know, it's evolving so quickly. Mm -hmm. People have much more of a handle on what an impact your interior environment has on your well-being and your state of mind and everything else about you, how you operate as, a, as, a, as an organism in that, in that space, um, you know, it's, it's becoming so important and I, I just think there's so much, there's so much to learn. Mm. Every day is a learning day. Mm. Nobody knows everything, do they? So, no. and if you've got a question about something, somebody else has that same question. And I've it's, forgotten it's, half it's, of it, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if, it, if you're prepared to ask for help, and yeah. say, actually, I don't know that. You know, I make that clear with anybody that I'm working with. I'm going to ask lots of questions of you because I'm trying to understand what you want, what you need. Mm -hmm. um, you might not know the answer straight away, so feel free to say I'll come back to that. And likewise, you might ask me something, and actually there's a bigger picture for me to build, so I might tell you I'll come back mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah. So I think having that transparency and um, approach to n not n knowing everything is wise. And one other thing that people might be concerned about is the relationship with suppliers. So how open were they to dealing with you when you first started off? Um, yeah, I, for the majority, it's fine. But I'd say there's a few where it's kind of like, who are your top three suppliers that you already use? And it's kind of like, oh, we don't really use anyone at the moment. So what do we do? Like, do we, yeah. Can we just say that these are three or not? And that's a bit strange, like trying to go through that. I mean, now it's fine. We've got a whole like, mm. roster of people that we would we would source from but yeah when we first started it there were a few kind of like oh you've not done anything before mm. and I think having been a student asking for samples from people is that you kind of are already aware that people don't want to send samples out just willy-nilly mm -hmm. if they don't think you're official so um yeah but it was, yeah, it was fine mm. we got there what do you think on that one Susie yeah I think it's, it's it's like that whole thing about not wanting to be a member of any club that wouldn't have, or you know, the saying I'm trying to, Gratro Mark said it. And once you once you get that tipping point, once you've got those first few trade accounts, uh -huh. you're off and away. But they can be really protective. Yeah. And I, I yeah. do get it because people, you know, lots of people, I don't know whether it happens so much now, but there used to be a thing where people would have a set of business cards printed up when they were doing up their own home and sort of blow uh, into yeah. into uh -uh. Colfax and Fowler and say, mm. I'm so and so of you know, blah 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 interiors <laughs> and, and expect to get their full trade discount. Mm -hmm. So I think and then of course that really upsets the people who are genuinely trade customers. So I think the suppliers have to be quite careful too. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. one final question. What has been the most joyful and positive thing that you found in your new career compared to your old one? Um, so, I mean, I love the variety. I love that every project has been very different. I think one of my concerns was that we were going to be doing, or well, ended up doing very, in being a Cornwall, just coastal schemes everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but actually it's not been like that at all. It's just been an amazing amount of variety. Like every client has given us just really fantastic briefs. So we've been very lucky, both from residential and commercial aspects. It's, yeah, so we're working on like a gelato shop at the moment, which is like crazy pastels. And then <laughs> we're doing this old coach house, which is all sort of bauer textures and stuff as well. So I don't know, it just gets a lovely mix of, mm. lovely mix of projects. What have you enjoyed most, Charlotte? I think getting nice feedback. Yeah, that's quite reassuring when somebody says, oh, I would have never thought of that. That's a really good idea. And you're like, yeah, actually it is, isn't it? Let's go with that. Um, so I think that's re really nice. There's so many things actually. It's, it's variety and um, being creative is just amazing, obviously. That's why we're here. But uh, thinking about how people are going to enjoy their home or the space, um, whether it's public space or yeah, somebody's home, it's nice to see that being used as it should be. It's a shame when you see it, where you say examples where people have spent lots of money and you think oh if only we'd been there earlier on mm. and then when you ac actually are involved and you see the outcome and see people enjoying themselves it's really mm. really nice 
Susie, what about oh, so you? I think, I think for me it's maybe two things. The, the occasionally when a client says to you, you've changed my life. Mm. And that's really such mm. a profound moment. I love it when that happens. But the other thing I really love is I don't have that terrible sinking feeling on a Sunday night. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I bounce yeah. out of bed every day of my mm. working life and I'm thinking about what I have to do that morning in the shower and I burst out my front door mm. and, you know, mm. rushing to the office to get stuck into it. And it's just... It, it's never boring. Quite a lot of the time yeah, I wake up and I'm like, <laughs> I don't think it's never boring. what day is it? Like there isn't such thing as Sunday blues or Monday morning. So I do often have to think, hang on, work out what day it is because every day feels like it holds the same fun and value. So it's not kind of a five day week and then a weekend that's the best bit. It's, it's all the best bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I lose track of what day it is. A lot of the time. And that's a good that's thing. That's nice. That's really nice. <laughs> that yeah. is a good thing. Excellent. Stephen, Charlotte, Susie, it's been a brilliant conversation. I'm sure everybody's got a lot out of it. Can we give them all a round of applause? Thank you also to Sofa.com for providing the furniture, for Design Central for hosting us here at Coombe Lodge. And a final thank you to you, our audience. I think you were terrific too. We do hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do get in touch on our social channels at Interior Design Business Pod if you want to share feedback. The Interior Design Business is a Wildwood Plus production. Thank you very much. Thank you.